You're listening to Yum Cha, a news podcast from Hong Kong Free Press, with me, Mercedes Hutton. This week, wildlife trade and alien invaders, with Dr. Astrid Anderson. Hong Kong's position, both geographically and ideologically as a free trade port, has made it one of the primary hubs for the world's wildlife trade. Over the decades, the city has been central to the movement of live animals and wildlife products, both legally and illegally obtained, making it complicit in declining African elephant populations and the functional extinction of the northern white rhino. The industry has also shaped Hong Kong's biodiversity. Native species the Chinese pangolin is critically endangered according to the International Union of the Conservation of Nature's Red List, due to demands for its meat and scales. But trade also goes the other way, introducing non-native species that don't strictly belong here. Dr. Astrid Anderson is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Hong Kong and a National Geographic explorer who has dedicated much of her scientific career to researching a critically endangered species that has not only made its home in the centre of Hong Kong, but thrived. We met as the sun was setting on a bright winter's day in Hong Kong Park, an 80,000 square metre green enclave nestled just behind some of Central's most distinctive skyscrapers, on the lookout for what Astrid calls alien invaders, a species of parrot with a jazzy yellow crest and an even more recognisable squawk. This is what they do at this time of night. They just kind of squawk in communication. Right, OK. Oh, there we go. And I have been here at dawn and lots of times at dusk Mm -hmm. and there's um different groups that come from you know the east the west and they just congregate here in hong kong park it's a really unusual situation you know we're here in like the most urban and developed and uh, cosmopolitan part of hong kong really like admiralty we've got major banks um, you know, it's the CBD, basically. And here is the hotspot, the real home base for cockatoos in Hong Kong. It's bizarre. It's crazy. But that's the truth. And they're not, you know, they're not native to Hong Kong, but this is what the, one of the main areas that they've made their home here. And do we know how many are here, how large the population is? There's approximately 200 individuals, but they're not all here in Hong Kong Park. There are some in the um, in Victoria Park, as well as on the western side of Hong Kong Island, and actually also some out in Stonecutters Island on uh, the other side, Kowloon side. Okay, and how on earth did they come to be here if they're not supposed to be here? They actually are a very popular cage bird pet. So um, people like to keep parrots, cockatoos included, as uh, a pet because they're very colorful they very intelligent they can learn how to say words and especially in the 80s and early 90s yellow crested cockatoos which is this species that we find here in hong kong were very popular there were over 70,000 of them exported from indonesia at that time so that was 10 years or so and to all over, not just Hong Kong, they were also exported to Singapore and North America and Europe. Uh, but they were really popular at that time. And it's, it's, yeah, around then that they started showing up in Hong Kong as well in large numbers. And is it known how they came to be in, in the wild, so to speak? Are they, were, they, were they released? Was it a purposeful uh, introduction? Um, no, it's kind of... You know, there are some theories and so on, but during my PhD at the University of Hong Kong, I actually tried to find out. I tried to look in uh, records, I talked to historians, and the the most popular theory is that the governor of Hong Kong during the Japanese invasion 
in World War II, he had a bunch of these cockatoos as pets. And when the Japanese were advancing, he released them. And then, you know, that was the founder population that really helped to create this population that we now find here. But I do think that even if that's true, this population is most likely supplemented by continual escapees or released individuals because when we do, we do an annual uh, cockatoo count here in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and I always see a few individuals that I notice are of a slightly different subspecies or, you know, a different species altogether mixed in with these guys. So I think that there's, these, these cockatoos are super clever, you know, they, they can, they can escape if they want to. <laughs> and, and also, I think in a Hong Kong apartment, they might not be the most um, appropriate pet in many ways because they can be super loud and super messy and that could get annoying. They're also monogamous, so they tend to favor one person in the household over another. And when I mean favor, I mean they will like attack the other one. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, and they live for a, around 70 years. Wow, okay. Seven zero. So they can outlive a lot of their owners or the owners can pass on, you know, and lots of stuff can happen. While you now see Hong Kongers walking dogs and sometimes cats around town, domestic cat and dog ownership is a relatively new trend. For decades, birds were particularly popular pets because they were considered easy to keep and perhaps more importantly, were permitted in public housing estates, unlike larger animals. In the 80s and early 90s, it was not uncommon for people to bring songbirds in delicately crafted bamboo cages with them to dim sum, their chirps and tweets adding to the clangorous sounds of the restaurants. But a bird flu outbreak in the city in 1997 led to stricter regulations relating to how and where people could transport birds, and they subsequently fell out of fashion as pets. According to 2005 census data, birds accounted for almost 10% of pets owned in Hong Kong, by 2016, a veterinary industry study showed that figure had fallen to 7%. Are cockatoos still traded here? Yeah, I did, um, for the first few years of my PhD, surveys of the bird market, and I mm -hmm. did see that there were cockatoos for sale there, including yellow crested. Um, but the thing is, you are allowed to trade birds that have been reared in captivity. And there are some farms and breeders, you know, that, that may well be um, breeding yellow crested cockatoos. But then the issue arises when you can't really tell, say a cockatoo has been smuggled from Indonesia in a plastic bottle mm -hmm. and then put in the bird market. Yeah. How are, how are people supposed to know? Yeah. There's, there's these methods like you're supposed to see that they have a, a band on their leg with an ID number. But in, when I was doing the survey, I noticed a few birds didn't have a band or they had a band that, uh, you know, was you could remove or it didn't have a number on. There didn't seem to be a like really consistent um, standard for these for these identifications and traceability means. Mm -hmm. And as, do you think they're still a popular species in terms of like for the pet trade? I think cockatoos, yeah, in general cockatoos. Mm -hmm. Maybe not specifically yellow crested, mm -hmm. but people seem to like cockatoos. There's about, I think there's about 10 or 15 species of cockatoo, I'm not sure. But <laughs> they, uh, they are all, you know, super attractive birds. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, there's a lot of videos on YouTube and stuff that show the really fun side of, of cockatoos and parrots, which is, you know, their interactive, engaging nature. Sure. But yeah, as with many pets, it comes with all sorts of responsibilities, mm -hmm. costs, vets, you know, all of this stuff. So, yeah. And also the fact that they live for so long. I don't know that many people are aware of that. I certainly wasn't aware of that. Um, but I do know that birds have kind of for a, lot, for a long time been popular pets in Hong Kong, not, not exclusively cockatoos, but birds generally. Um, and it kind of comes from quite a long tradition. Um, but I guess you would you would advise against keeping birds as pets. Uh, I mean, it kind of depends where they've come from, and what species I think as mm -hmm. well. So yeah, there's a l large um, songbird trade as well as parrots. So in 
different parts of Asia, uh, there's a culture of keeping songbirds that you know have can sing very nicely. Um, in some areas like Thailand and Indonesia, they have competitions. But I, I think in Hong Kong, it's probably more small scale if there are any such mm -hmm. competitions. But like, yeah, just as a nice companion pet sort of thing. And um, now, you know, it's for some species got to the point where the demand has has meant that in the wild, the populations are really small. Right. Um, and some of these species also have not been properly researched by scientists, so there's not that much knowledge about whether they are there. There might be a you know a distinct population in a, like a forest that's really different from another one, but they look exactly the same mm -hmm. or something like that. So this type of um, cryptic species that we call it could be being traded and um, as pets, but disappearing from the wild before we even really noticed them. And is that is that true of cockatoos or the, sorry, is it yellow crested or sulfur crested here? Oh my God, that is such a good question. So <laughs> sulfur crested cockatoos are the big cockatoos that we see in Australia. Okay. Australia has many cockatoo species. It's like the home base for mm -hmm. cockatoos. But um, the big white one with the yellow mohawk that's in Australia, that is the sulfur crested cockatoo. That's the common name. Okay. And the scientific name is Kakatua gallerita. Then we have Kakatua sulfurea, confusingly, which is not sulfur crested cockatoo. Oh. It's yellow crested cockatoo. Okay. Which is what we've got here in Hong Kong and which is found in Indonesia, different islands of Indonesia. And that's a critically endangered species. Right. So I don't know that, you know, the bankers working in these towers here in Hong Kong, they know that when they look out the window while they're on their conference call and they see these birds flying past, it's actually a really rare species. It's uh, yellow crested cockatoos are on birders lists. They want to take it off. They never see it it's super rare because it's in these remote islands of Indonesia. It's not the, the one that's found everywhere in Sydney that is digging in the bins and all that stuff. That's a different species. <laughs> right, okay, got it. So the, these are yellow crested cockatoos. So uh, yeah, so the same thing perhaps is true of, of that species then in that we've got them here and yet there's fewer of them left in their native habitats. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. So in Indonesia, they are now very rare, critically endangered. Mm -hmm. And uh, the biggest, I think the, the largest remaining population is in Komodo National Park, where they have 700. But there's estimated to only be around 2,500 remaining in the whole of Indonesia. So the fact that we've got 200 of that species yeah. here in Hong Kong is quite, you know, special. Um, and it's interesting as well because the... Excuse the uh, <laughs> sounds in the background. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. The various city noises. Uh -huh. We're we are in the middle of the city, mm. even though we're in a park. Yeah, yeah. So there, the yellow crested cockatoo in Indonesia is on different islands, including Sumba, Sulawesi, Komodo, as I mentioned, and a few other ones. And um, there hasn't been until yet any uh, research into the genetics to see whether the cockatoos on these different islands might actually be different species, but they look very similar, but they might have been separated for long enough that their evolutionary development has made them very different in, wow. their, in their genes and stuff. Astrid was born in Sweden, but grew up in Hong Kong, interacting with the city's wildlife and developing a love for animals and nature from an early age. But she didn't exactly set out to work with cockatoos. It's a pretty niche area of study. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, people don't believe me when I say I'm a cockatoo researcher, but it's true. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> yeah, so how did it come about? Um, I was actually previously working for a number of NGOs on environmental issues. And in Hong Kong, there was a strong focus on traded species. So everything from shark fin to traded birds, or um, ivory and And these pangolins. are both legal and illegal trades. Yeah, well, some are purely illegal. Yeah. 
but uh, some like shark fin and ivory to an extent and birds it's it's a mix of mm -hmm. illegal and legal which is kind of part of the problem because it's not di easy for consumers to really tell um, the difference yeah a 2019 report prepared by philanthropic organization ADM Capital Foundation titled trading in extinction described Hong Kong's wildlife trade as and I quote, significant and unsustainable. According to the report, which was put together by members of the Hong Kong Wildlife Trade Working Group, the sheer volume of the live animal trade is disturbing. Although the majority of such animals imported into Hong Kong were bred and raised in captivity, nearly 60% of live birds were taken from the wild, having implications for local and regional ecosystems. I didn't really specialize in any species. It was really any cause that, of like a traded species. But in Hong Kong, the issues kind of developed. So there was a time where myself and a number of other uh, campaigners and organizations were trying to get ivory to be stop being sold in shops because it's difficult to tell a legally antique piece of ivory from a freshly poached ivory. Um, and then pangolins became like a really hot topic um, later on and so I did some some um, interviewing about that and trying to figure out consumption rates in Hong Kong and attitudes towards that and yeah so also there was a time when we were trying to get different uh, uh, what do you call it hotels and like mm. airlines and um, restaurant Fe chains FedEx and all that sort yeah. of thing to stop serving or, or transporting shark fin so that was another campaign that we worked on then so basically what happened was there was a an opening at HKU for a PhD on um, these cockatoos and because I had worked in traded species the professor was like do you want to do you want to apply for this position and here I am today. Yeah. And did you have a science background? Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my bachelor's, which uh, feels like, you know, a lifetime ago, mm -hmm. was in politics and international development. And then I worked, as I said, as uh, an environmental sort of campaigner. And yeah. So, I mean, that involved a bit of social science research, mm -hmm. like interviewing and um, these policy things. So, yeah, I think hard science, no. That was something I had to, you know, work on during my five years of PhD. Yeah, but you do do hard science now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, what, can you explain what you're doing as your, as, as your postdoc? Right, yeah. So, during, well, during my PhD, I was able to um, sample some of the Hong Kong cockatoo population because there was, during that five, six years, a number of cockatoos that died of natural causes here in Hong Kong. So typhoon victims or fledglings that, you know, fell out of the nest, um, and they get sent to Kadori Farm or SPCA. So over the years, I uh, built up, uh, you know, a database of, of samples, and then now for my PA, uh, my postdoc, sorry, I will be looking into the genetics of the cockatoos that we find here in Hong Kong and trying to figure out are they inbred, are they hybrids or are they, you know, pure subspecies of yellow crested cockatoos? Are they from a certain island in Indonesia or another one or that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. And what clues can you, will you be able to glean from, from that information beyond so, where they come from. Yeah, I think that sort of information will be very useful for the conservation of yellow crested cockatoos because if it turns out that the Hong Kong population came from, um, you know, an island in Indonesia that nowadays doesn't have many cockatoos or the population is very small, then in the future, the cockatoos here could be potential candidates for translocation. Mm -hmm back into the wild in Indonesia. I mean, this is all, you know, very much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, that could, if, if required, if there was genetic rescue needed in Indonesia and it was, you know, assessed to be safe and, and all of the proper procedures that you have to do and you 
when you reintroduce birds uh, were followed, that could, that could happen. You know, it could turn out that Hong Kong has actually provided a reservoir, a genetic reservoir for this mm -hmm. critically endangered species. And in terms of the, the indigenous spe like species or their na in their native habitats, what threats do they face? Because presumably Hong Kong, I, I, I cannot imagine it being the, the ultimate environment for, for a bird population to thrive, and yet it seems to be the case. So why, can, do you, are you aware why they, they have you know, done so well here and perhaps not in their, where they come from? Yeah, well in Indonesia, unfortunately, the major pressure has been trapping for right. the pet trade. So during the 80s and 90s, when it was still um, perfectly legal to do so, they were trapped at rates that were just completely unsustainable. Um, and then actually that has continued. So in, I think it was 2015 or 2016, there was this case where uh, 20 or so yellow-crested cockatoos were intercepted by customs in Indonesia and they were stuffed inside plastic bottles. Oh, I think I've seen that picture. Yeah. I think it went viral. Yeah, it did, it did. So they were illegally trapped because now the yellow crested have been fully protected in Indonesia. Okay. But yeah, so that's the major threat they face there, um, which seems to still be sort of continued threat, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And then there's the usual habitat loss, climate change, all yeah. that sort of thing. But here in Hong Kong, it is interesting that they have found a way to, you know, to thrive. Yeah. They reproduce. I've seen during my PhD nests and successful fledglings and things. But um, it's, I mean, I think it's because they are intelligent birds and they're able to figure out. They've seemed to, in Hong Kong, have stayed close to the um, parks, urban parks. Mm -hmm. So Hong Kong Park and Victoria Park. And I think that's because there are these ornamental tree species so like exotic planted tree species that produce fruits that they'll consume and they might be able to find more of a you know constant supply throughout different times of year here. So yeah, that's why people always ask me, why don't they go up to, you know, Lung Fu Shan yeah. or the different country parks? And I think it's one of the reasons is that. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned that there, there's a population on Stonecutters Island but there isn't any in Kowloon or the New Territories? There have been reports. Mm -hmm. So I also looked into the Hong Kong Bird Watching Society kindly shared with me all the reports that they've had dating back to 1964 of um, different cockatoo. Oh, there was one. I just heard one. Yeah, <laughs> flapping around there. Um, <laughs> different observations that have been recorded by their Hong Kong Bird Watching Society members. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit confused because for, for a period there were quite a few uh, recorded in Kowloon Park. Uh, but when I went there, I didn't see any, although my colleague did tell me that he saw some there the other day. But, you know, it's difficult. They move around. Of course. They're, yeah. they're very, actually, people always come to me and they're like, oh, I see them in this tree every single day. And I'm like, okay great let's go there yeah. and I go there and they're not there because they are very they're very changeable like mm -hmm. they do whatever they feel like doing on that particular day be it the weather or their mood or you know it's it's not easy to kind of figure out what they're doing yeah and over the years have you come to uh, recognize anyone's like any any individuals yeah I have actually there's one which I reckon is, you know, an older, well, I know it's a female because mm -hmm. you can see from the red sheen on the eye. Okay. It's quite subtle, but if you get catch it in the light, you can see. And she has, I don't know if it's, you know, overzealous preening by a partner or what. She's basically got no feathers on her head. Okay, poor thing. thing. Yeah. Or it could just be old age. But she know. stands out. Yeah, she because does. Because of it. Yeah. <laughs> And I had a few camera traps around and I could tell that, you know, she mm -hmm. had, my camera traps would capture videos of her kind of telling off some, some younger birds and stuff. Right. So. Mm. And you mentioned earlier that they were monogamous. I mean, you were talking about with people, but presumably that's true with birds. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. So a lot of, it, there's a bit of debate about monogamy in bird species, but we can tell that they definitely pair up mm -hmm. cockatoos 
and they preen each other, they stay in a couple for long term, and they go back to the same cavity in the tree. They don't build nests, so they use pre-existing cavities in trees. Right. And if they find a good one, you know, they go back several seasons with the same mate. Um, but yeah, it's not known whether they truly are monogamous. Right. They might still be spreading their seed, you know, around, mm -hmm. which would evolutionarily make more sense. But yeah. yeah, then couple up for the kind of to save energy when doing things like child rearing or yeah. And so you mentioned earlier, we were just walking up these steps uh, in the park to try and find the cockatoos and um, looking for a certain tree and it's no longer here. Yeah. But you mentioned that you'd seen twice seen fledglings in it. So presumably that was one of the nests that they returned to. Yes. So there was this big tree next to the marriage registry with a, with a really good cavity in it. And um, it had been used multiple breeding seasons and I'd seen two chicks sticking their head out of this out of this cavity one year which is quite rare normally the cockatoos lay two or three eggs but only one of the chicks will survive and fledge so yeah this was a good tree <laughs> that has now been chopped down but it did look like it wasn't in the best of health you know it would look a little bit um, old maybe the tree mm -hmm. so it could be for that reason you know yeah, keep the public safe. It is right next to a path here. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Do the do the cockatoos get into uh, fisticuffs with other bird species around? Yes. Yeah, so that was one chapter of my PhD thesis focused on: Do they impact the native species right. of Hong Kong? Because a lot of people are concerned about that. You know, it's one of the mm. major questions I get. And um, a Hong Kong's native habitat in central and eastern and western district of Hong Kong Island has um, been completely altered by humans. So the native habitat, so to speak, is not in pristine condition, you know? Yeah. The birds that we have here, sparrows, doves, that sort of thing, they're, they're, I, I think they're not what people are worried about when they say native species. Mm -hmm. And um, the trees also in these urban parks, as I mentioned previously, they are usually planted, introduced trees. So there's a lot of trees from like Madagascar and stuff here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a really complicated topic thinking about interactions between introduced birds, birds that are very common in urban environments introduced trees native trees I, I mean there's even the question of like what is a native species how far back do we go the ice age <laughs> you know <laughs> so yeah it's an interesting question but i found that the hong kong cockatoos do not interact with other birds that often and in this area hong kong park victoria park as well um they do not really compete with any other cavity nesting species because the only birds that they interacted with were nest building. They didn't need the cavities, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's enough food, presumably, to go round as well. So in an, in an anthropogenic environment, there'll be all sorts of food that mm -hmm. they can exploit. So yeah, I found that here, it wasn't a huge issue. Some, one thing that uh, the government could do in Hong Kong if they wanted to support the cockatoo population is to put up nest boxes um, to help. Uh, and have you had conversations with officials and administrators about, about the cockatoo population here? Yeah, yeah. AFCD were very interested in my PhD results. We, I did presentations for them. I shared the results and yeah, I had a very good relationship mm -hmm. with them actually. And still, I will also share the results of the genetic study, too. That was Dr. Astrid Anderson, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Hong Kong, talking us through Hong Kong's introduced cockatoo population. You've been listening to Yumcha. 
a news podcast from Hong Kong Free Press. Written, produced and edited by me, Mercedes Hutton. HKFP is a member of the Trust Project. Find out all about our journalistic standards by visiting hongkongfp.com forward slash ethics. And for more informative and impartial coverage, and to learn how to support our journalist-led newsroom, visit hongkongfp.com.